Um, as you all just noticed, we just started recording. Um, thank you so much for being here today, um, superintendents, admin teams, BOCES teams um, from a quad across Western New York and even New York State. Um, we're so honored that you're here today and um, we are honored to have our speakers here today as well. Um, my name is Tarya Parsonen. I'm with the Western New York Education Alliance. And um, I, we, I'm here representing the Western New York Literacy Initiative, which is a collaboration of 17 organizations, including Mayor Brown in the city of Buffalo, Villa Maria College. I'm gonna go through them because I really do have to honor these organizations that are, that are behind this. The Buffalo Police Athletic League, Dyslexia Allies of Western New York, Dyslexia Services of Western New York, the Ed Trust New York, Literacy Buffalo Niagara, Monkey See Monkey Do Children's Bookstore, the New York State Network for Youth Success and the After School Network of Western New York, Nye House Education Center with our speaker Tracy White Whedon here, uh, the Reading League with Maria Murray is here speaking, Read to Succeed Buffalo, Say Yes Buffalo, Teach My Kids to Read, We the Parents of Western New York, Western New York Education Alliance and the Western New York Literacy Collaborative. So this is really people dealing with literacy in every aspect, whether it's students, adult literacy, families, parents, uh, you name it, um, after school programs, um, pre-K programs, um, they're, they're touching kids in, in the literacy sense and in every way. And the mission really is to increase awareness about the science of reading and to facilitate partnerships between local schools and education organizations that support evidence-based reading instruction. So thank you all for being here. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen right now. And um, I'm going to introduce our speakers and, and get going because they, they are the real experts here. Um, Dr. Tracy White Whedon and Dr. Maria Murray will give opening remarks this morning. Dr. Tracy White Whedon is the president and CEO of Nye House Education Center. She is a seasoned leader dedicated to advancing literary, literacy success for all and academic excellence for children. She brings 28 years of experience to a calling of shaping dynamic systems change so that children are well prepared for the realities of a 21st century knowledge economy. White is also a relentless literacy advocate who frames literacy as a fundamental human right that transforms the family tree when evidence-based practices are scaled responsibly. Her life's work has been to position literacy success for all as a moral imperative that creates a place at the table for every child and adult, regardless of zip code or country of origin. And speaking along with her giving opening remarks is Dr. Maria Murray. Dr. Maria Murray is president and CEO of the Reading League. Before founding the Reading League, Dr. Murray was an associate professor at the State University of New York at Oswego, where she taught courses related to literacy assessment and intervention for 10 years. She received her PhD in reading education from Syracuse University, where she served as project coordinator with Dr. Benita Blockman, Blockman's numerous federally funded early reading intervention grants. Dr. Murray is passionate about the prevention and remediation of reading difficulty and consistently strives to increase educator and stakeholder knowledge and the connections between research and practice. Dr. Murray and Dr. Whedon, welcome, and I'm turning this over to you. Good morning, good morning, thank you. Sister Maria. I'm ready, sister. Um, I'm so Welcome. honored to be in this space with you. Let's do this. Okay, Let's... glad that you chose to be a part of this space today. And um, we wanna talk to you about our journey and connect it to your journey. As you saw, one of the challenges that we see nationally is we see best practices and there's a light out there of growing best practices. There are next practices yet to be discovered. And frankly, there's malpractice that mm -hmm. is not serving our children or our educators well. Would you agree, Maria? I would. And um, I'm always honored to present with you because we see very much the ramifications of this work. Our organizations are very similar. We're collaborative and we complement each other. So I'm really pleased to be here to talk to you about um, the critical role of, of this work um, for those who are with us today. Thank you for everyone for coming. You know, it's so important for 
I think all of us to remember our why. <laughs> and so we want to pose that question today. What is your why? And as you can see, the, there is a collage of pictures and mine would show that my mom was central to my journey, who was a struggling reader because she went to 10 different schools and had gaps. She was not dyslexic, but she did not have those gaps filled or identified. But she was determined that the seven of us would be avid readers. And so we didn't even know she struggled until we were adults and we were all voracious readers. But it literally transformed our family tree. I'm the oldest of seven. And, and the abject poverty my mother and father came out of was overcome through literacy. And, and I do want to mention that you'll see different pictures of children, some of whom um, were navigating the main streets of Detroit and came to my English classroom um, in the hopes of growing and being prepared for a 21st century. And, and also um, majority white suburban district I worked in. And I saw the same thing, the children of poverty falling through the cracks and the children um, who were black and brown not achieving at the highest levels they could. So that is my, literacy is a privilege I'm determined to pay forward. And Maria, I know you have an amazing why as well. Yes, um, I changed my pictures just this morning to add in the three that are in the bottom. My why centers around um, coming from a history of being an educator, but not knowing about why my students could not read at, at, at a secondary level. And Dr. Blackman is pictured in the two top right pictures where I learned from her how to prevent and remediate difficulties. And I learned to train teachers and I watched them turn the science of reading into the art of teaching. And, but all through these wonderful experiences, I saw it fizzle away. So I'm no longer content with providing professional development that is one and done that doesn't lead to true, long lasting, sustainable, um, different cultures of um, understanding the importance, the urgency and the promise of all children learning to read as best as they can and teachers knowing how to do their art and their work. So the last three pictures down at the bottom really highlight my why and drive me every single day you can see this video when stars read um, on YouTube. I took screenshots this morning. And uh, after we had taught these children to read in this study and followed them for a decade, they were the children in the book Overcoming Dyslexia with the Yale Dyslexia Center. But I got to spend a summer with these families and these children ran away from home. They got hives, they threw up, they got bullied. And uh, learning to read was, or not learning to read actually was torture. So um, it, it's not something that ends as soon as the school bus drops kids off at the end of the day. It continues, it impacts the family, it impacts everybody in that home, this child's soul. So I just keep these kids and the kids that still exist like them today in my heart and in my work at the forefront. This is my why. So thank you for listening to that. And I'm sure everyone could say the same. That's beautiful, Maria. Thank you. It, it, it was such an honor to participate in the defining movement, Maria, and to be invited to the table by you. Everyone needs to know about this from you as well. Yeah. So um, we share concerns. I think a lot of us in this room, uh, Zoom room do. We share concern. Um, that the science of reading may be underutilized or misused. Many um, experiences we've had have led to that understanding that that could be happening. So although we have a scientific evidence base that has existed for decades, probably going on 50 years, that term science of reading is certainly a buzzword, isn't it? It's a catchphrase, it's everywhere now. It's gained a lot of traction and when that happens in education, let's be honest, uh, that can lead to misapplication um, or misunderstanding. So one particular one that's happening now is that the science of reading is just about foundational skills or, or phonics, and that can't be, that's not true at all. Um, 
it it definitely attends to the criticality of building knowledge background knowledge, language comprehension, etc. But the Reading League uh, loves to be a league, loves to bring communities of practice together. And one such that we did was this uh, group of people that, and we worked together, Tracy, for an hour a week for over a year. Uh, and we got some good people together to say, do you think we should try to define the science of reading? so that it is not um, misunderstood, so that it is, doesn't become weakened and fail to serve its promise to children and, and their educators and their communities. So the result of it is this guide. We thought we'd just come up with a little definition, but you know how when you get a bunch of brilliant people in the room, everyone has good ideas. And so it was an amazing experience. Um, yes. We hope that, um, but we had a rationale and Tracy's going to actually go over our preamble, but the rationale was that we could support educators and parents or, or other leaders as they discern what is and what is not in alignment with the science of reading. To assist people to become informed and wise consumers of materials and PD and resources to impact policy policy, excuse me, and publishers decisions as they develop materials and policy guidelines to guide people in true educational transformation that'll lead to sustainable change and to unify the effort of all stakeholders on behalf of students to ensure the advancement of educational equity. So we think the defining guide as a result um, is a gift to, um, to you here today too. So I will switch, uh, Tracy, you can Absolutely. get a, um, download the ebook ebook at that uh, site or get a hard copy if you prefer. Okay. And as Maria switches to the preamble, you'll see there's a YouTube video if you choose to use it. It was such an honor to be able to do the first draft draft of the preamble and get feedback from these amazing thought leaders nationally. And I do want to say this is a moment. Mm -hmm. This is a defining moment in that I, I define it as a COVID chrysalis where we can come out of this so much better, so much more prepared to rethink how we're educating children. And I think back to when I was an assistant superintendent over curriculum instruction and assessment for the seventh largest district in the country. And I didn't know what I did not know. And had I known as fully what I know now, I could have done so much more good work. Yes, we did good work, but we could have done more for more children and more educators. So it is so important not to let this moment pass us by as educators and to say on our watch, things are going to change. And so again, the preamble is a why for us collectively that I hope you will find um, resonates with you. Mm -hmm. Humankind's most precious treasure is our children and our future depends on them. We recognize literacy as a fundamental human right that empowers individuals in a society. We also know that grim life outcomes are connected to, to illiteracy. We are resolved to prevent the collateral damage that is incurred by our students, especially the most vulnerable among them, when adults have limited access to the convergent scientific evidence. Research has identified assessment and instructional practices with which every teacher and leader should be equipped. We believe that providing educators with this knowledge is a moral imperative. We are committed to evidence-aligned reading instruction being scaled with a sense of urgency in a comprehensive and systematic way by multiple stakeholders. And as we wrap up, I know we only have 10 minutes, Maria, and we probably are just a bit over that. This is our chrysalis moment. Mm -hmm. We are each leading organizations and people. Leading means influencing so that people want to follow with us. And we exist to build that educator knowledge and decision-making knowledge as organizations. Niles Education Center combining with our sister organization, the Reading League. It's through knowledge that we can begin and sustain these practices in a way that's truly transformational. 
And it requires something that I've learned in working with superintendents and state departments nationally. It's how you're leveraging time, talent, and funding. And it's being willing to strategically abandon what's not working well for educators and working well for children. We have to create the space for the new. And if we're doing a hundred things and they're all a priority, then nothing's a priority. Right. Literacy should be the priority. Educator knowledge, first and foremost, is how I want to end this. That's all, mm -hmm. period. Educator knowledge, and that includes educators at all levels. Without the practitioner knowing the things they have to know, no matter what tools we put in front of them to use, won't have that same impact we need it to have. So thank you. I, I hope we're not too over. Yeah. Out of the gate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Whedon and Dr. Murray. You are so inspirational. And everyone, we're so lucky to be able to hear from these two literacy icons. Um, I'm so inspired by you all. Um, we're going to now start, go quickly over to our, our speakers, Dr. Goffney and Dr. Chaucer. And Dr. Latanya Goffney will go first. She serves as the superintendent of schools for the Aldine Independent School District. And since taking the helm in July 2018, Dr. Goffney has dedicated herself to nearly 62,000 students and more than 9,300 employees of the district, as well as the entire Aldine community. She has increased student achievement in every district she's served, including Aldine ISD, by focusing on early childhood education, literacy, targeted professional development for teachers, and collaboration across the community, including developing business and school partnerships, parent engagement, and increased communication. In recognition of her efforts, Dr. Goffney has received numerous awards and honors, including being named Superintendent of the Year by the Texas Association of School Boards in 2017, and the Texas Association of School Administrators nominee for the 2018 American Association of School Administrators National Superintendent of the Year Award. In 2019, AASA, the School Superintendents Association, named Dr. Goffney a finalist for the 2020 Superintendent Award. And more recently, the Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents, ALAS, honored Dr. Goffney with the organization's inaugural National Champions of Equity Award. She's a native of Cold Spring, Texas. Dr. Goffney is a Sam Houston State University graduate. She earned her bachelor's degree in history, a master's in educational administration, and a doctorate in educational leadership. She served as superintendent of schools for Cold Spring, Oakhurst, CISD, and Lufkin ISD before becoming superintendent of Aldine ISD. Dr. Goffney, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I am super excited to join you today and super excited to be able to be a part of this important conversation. I want to thank my friend, Dr. Tracy Wheaton, my sister. Thank you so much for connecting. I feel like I'm amongst uh, family because I follow all of you on social media, uh, <laughs> on twi Twitter. So really excited about, uh, about being here. I'm also excited to have our chief academic officer, Dr. Todd Davis. So if there's anything that I say, if you place it in the chat, he'll be able to, uh, to respond. Um, I am just, again, thrilled thrilled. I wish we were in the same space and place, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to share with, um, with you all. Um, I am trying to adjust because if we were in the same space, I would be drawing from your positive energy. Um, I have a saying that says iron sharpens iron. And though, uh, although we are virtual, I hope we're able to sharpen, sharpen each other. Um, I am just a country girl, contrary to all of that that she just read. Just read. I am uh, Latonya Goffney. I'm the 15th. I'm in my 15th year as superintendent in Texas. And I wonder, can y'all hear my accent? Can you hear it? I always <laughs> love to visit New York because you all sound like you have an accent. I know that um, I probably sound like I have one as well. But um, I, as she alluded to, I have served in three different school districts. But I'm the proud superintendent now of All Dean ISD. And before you go searching, there is no All Dean Texas. We are located in Houston, Texas. And so if you've ever flown into Bush Intercontinental Airport, um, you were in the middle, you were in the middle of Aldine. Uh, we're 111 square miles of opportunity. Uh, we have uh, 83 campuses, just opened our 84th. As she uh, stated, pre-COVID, we were at 67,000 students and now we're trending um, nearly 62, 63,000. So um, I tell you about our demographics, not because 
uh, we make an excuse for them, but I want to make sure you understand the context. Nine out of 10 of our students are considered economically disadvantaged. They qualify for free or reduced lunch and 85% of them will qualify for free lunch. And so uh, it's just important for you to know that. We are, uh, we have 42% English language learners, 74% of our students are Hispanic, while 22% are African-American. We have over 46 languages that are spoken. You know, a lot of times when people hear about our de demographics, they sometimes have a certain mindset about our students and our district. And I'm gonna tell you today that we're so much more than our demographics. Uh, we don't ignore the reality that our students may face more challenges outside of school than most students. However, we commit ourselves to ensure that school is where the magic happens and that high quality support they receive in schools is, is the catalyst for lifelong empowerment. I am super proud to be the superintendent of all the ISD. And as I stated earlier, super proud to be with each of you today. But as my pastor used to say, I promise not to make you glad twice. Glad to see me start and glad to see me finish. I am gonna weave some personal and professional stories uh, so that you leave more committed than ever to be a literacy leader or a literacy learner by the end of our time together. I want you to be passionate about literacy and getting it right for all students and more convinced than ever that literacy matters. It's the gateway to opportunity and choice and <laughs> it's the great equalizer. It needs to become more than just a slogan because one thing I know for sure, literacy, Education, it changed the trajectory of my life. Um, I said earlier that I'm a country girl and there is nothing about my past that would have predicted that I would be joining you today. <laughs> I'm speaking to leaders across New York, <laughs> um, uh, serving as a superintendent of schools, sharing a story because I was born into uh, poverty. My mom, she was 14 years old when she got pregnant with me and she was 15 years old when she gave birth to me. and she didn't know who my father were, was. I, I just, I never knew my father. We lived in abject poverty, moved all the time. There were trailers with no indoor plumbing. There was drug use. There was domestic violence, you name it. When I was in fifth grade, my grandparents, uh, big mama and papa, <laughs> um, anybody have great grandparents? Um, they saved me. I moved in with them. My big mama, who only had a fifth grade education, worked as a maid for one of the local white families. And my grandfather, who only had a third grade education, he mowed lawns and collected cans. And Papa, he was illiterate. He couldn't read, he couldn't write, and he, he wrote his name with an X. But let me tell you, I learned so much from my grandparents. Both were hard workers. My grandfather, he encouraged me to read. And he would say, Tanya, if you can read, you can go anywhere. So I read a lot of books growing up. Reading helped me escape the hard reality of my home life. You know, I don't have a lot of good memories of my childhood and perhaps my fondest memory though was going to garage sales with my grandmother on Saturdays. She would always give me change so that I could go buy books. <laughs> you, had, <laughs> you had to know something about my grandma though. She didn't like stopping at a garage sale and not purchasing anything. So I always literally rummaged through the books and found something I wanted to read. And, you know, I read all kinds of books. I love different series. You know, I was born in the 70s, so in the 80s, 90s girl. I love Valley Girls, Nancy Drew, Babysitter's Club. And I love John Grisham and all of his legal thrillers. Um, at those garage sales, just to help my grandmother, I even purchased and read some of those Harlequin romance novels. <laughs> Don't tell my grandmother, but... The point is my grandparents supported and encouraged reading and I loved reading. Remember my grandfather told me that if you can read, you can go anywhere. And God planted dreams in my heart to go somewhere, to do something. And reading it provided me an open window into what was possible in life. It helped me to gain the tools necessary to create a future filled with opportunities. Books were a savior to me. Reading saved me. And you know, this is one of the reasons that drew me to Aldine. Many of my students in Aldine ISD may be living through similar experiences of abuse and poverty or come from less educated families. Many are challenged by language as they learn English with little assistance from their families or uh, those who have limited or no English proficiency. As I said earlier, 90% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch, which is considered a, a measure of low income status. The child was me. A love for reading is what saved me, bolstered me from the trauma children in poverty typically experience and provided some of my best memories. Reading lifted me up. 
It provided a gateway that led me to become the first in my family to graduate from college and eventually attain a doctoral degree. <laughs> it provided me so many different opportunities. And think about if teachers had not come into my life and taught me to read, I would not have been able to move beyond the confines of my childhood environment. I'm here, hopefully, you already know this, but to reiterate the fact that literacy is the great equalizer, it can truly change the trajectory of your life. And <laughs> it's one of the reasons that I became an educator to help set other children on the pathway out of generational poverty caused by generational systemic inequities. The problem has always been that we didn't know how to, to make it happen, how to make sure that kids know how to read. You know, uh, I started teaching in 1999 and I will never forget my first year as a teacher. I didn't know how to teach. I especially didn't know how to do for students. I didn't know what to do for students who couldn't read. Um, I was uh, placed at this uh, junior high campus. I was teaching eighth grade language arts and I'll never forget the campus was rated low performing and that's language I'm sure there's something that's equitable in New York so you understand what I'm saying. Rated low performing and we had to take what at the time was called the TOS test. And all I got were a set of literature books and grammar books that were organized by skill. Uh, the department chair and I worked together to create this calendar that focused on a skill week. We focused mostly on the skills that they had not done well on in seventh grade, inferences and generalizations, summary, main idea, and author's purpose. We had TOS worksheets. We had TOS workbooks. I spent most of my time creating transparencies for the overhead projector and walking through these strategies of how to do this and how to do that. And I had no idea that I didn't know what I was doing. And no one had taught me how to develop children's reading skills, particularly those who make it to higher grades without these skills. Yes, I'm sharing my first year teaching experience from over 20 years ago, but things haven't changed. <laughs> we still have a problem. <laughs> I'll never forget, uh, 2019, I'd just been named Supin um, Aldean in 2018, and I serve on uh, the superintendent's cabinet with the Texas Education Agency. And our commissioner was reviewing the scores, our NAEP scores, and he was talking about and shared that Texas was far behind other states in reading performance. And guess who was down there with us? Illinois, California, and yeah, New York. Y'all were at the bottom with us. In Texas, the reading results are even far worse for black and brown students. <laughs> I know this to be true, and you do too. You can't talk about literacy without understanding the historical context of race and poverty. The size of the test score gap between the wealthiest and the poorest students hasn't changed. And when you look at specifically African-American and Hispanic students' performance, the scores painted a picture that I refused to accept. And our commissioner, he is uh, straight laced. So he was just going through a uh, fourth grade reading percentage of students. And he was saying that, um, <laughs> looking at black, Hispanic and white performance and looking at the percentage of students, our white students, 48% of them were at or above uh, proficiency. Hispanic, 21% and black, 16%. <laughs> and, and, and it got worse. When you looked at eighth grade reading proficiency at or above, white students were at 59%, Hispanic 19, and black 11%. Now, believe it or not, I'm normally quiet at these meetings. I'm typically um, in a corner or you know multitasking or, uh, or something, but he was going over this information. I, I, my colleagues, we were quiet, like, you know, okay. But I, I couldn't remain quiet. I raised my hand and I asked a rhetorical question. I said, are black, brown and students of poverty inherently inferior? If not, then when are we gonna stop talking about it and do something about it? You know, of course I was very respectful to our commissioner of education, but I definitely got his attention and that of my colleagues from across the state. You know, sometimes we have to call it what it is, low expectations for black, brown and students of poverty. <laughs> In our district, that's one of the things that we did. We started calling it what it was. Our zip code is not destiny. We have hardworking uh, class parents who want the very best for their children. And we need to deliver on that promise. We want students to graduate college and career ready and we put choices and opportunities, then we gotta address this literacy. As I'm gonna say over and over again, and I've heard 
my uh, good friend Tracy Wheaton said, literacy is the great equalizer. And we've got to do something about it. Students who aren't reading proficiently by third grade struggle to learn in other subject areas. And rarely do they ever catch up in reading. They're also less likely to attend college and struggle to find living wage jobs. Remember my grandfather said, if you can read, you can go anywhere. And so when I came into Aldine, <laughs> uh, there were some sobering facts about um, Aldine when I joined over four years ago. Only 28% of our third graders could read on grade level. 28%. That meant that 72% were not reading on grade level. Our students were suffering. Our teachers cared and were working hard, but they didn't have the tools to make an impact. <laughs> I was uh, named again in 2018, and I do what any good superintendent, if you're out there, you look, listen, and learn, and you go and you gather information, because when you have good information, you can make good decisions. Um, I was blessed the semester before I arrived. There had been a curriculum audit, <clears throat> and um, if I can keep it real for a few minutes, <laughs> And I can call it like it was. And I have, um, again, my CAO, who's been in the district a long time. And so he knows it was the truth. We were a cult for balanced literacy and all that. Like literally we hosted the conference, whatever um, one of the celebrities would come into Texas. We actually hosted and all that. And everyone loved the balanced literacy approach. It was popular. But listen, I'm the new suit. The data told the story. It wasn't effective for all these ISD students. Um, when you think about it, I'll never forget we were looking and having conversations. The STAR test was the only time many of our students even saw grade level text. Think about that. If you were an eighth grade student, you didn't see eighth grade level text into the test. And if you were a fourth grade student, you didn't see fourth grade level text into the day of the test. <laughs> Trained leaders shared that teachers weren't the only ones fr frustrated, that students were getting frustrated. And the thing that was an aha for me, we were in a, a meeting and we were talking about the importance of exposing our students to grade level text. However, um, we had a, a leader in the district who said, if we show fourth graders, fourth grade level text in this district, they will become frustrated. Frustrated. She meant it. So we had these leveled readers and we've come up with leveled readers lead to leveled lives. And I'm not here to argue it. I know there are people who know uh, literacy much more better than I do, but I'm telling you what I know and what I saw and the beliefs that people had about what black, brown and poor students should be able to have access to. And I also remember my grandfather. And I remember the fact that we had students who are graduating who can't read. Imagine that level of frustration. And so, um, we halted our textbook adoption. In Texas, we have textbook adoption in 2019 was our year. And we I knew then, and it was um, stated in the curriculum audit that we needed to abandon the approach to literacy to help solidify and to make sure, because again, we were a huge cult for um, balanced literacy that wasn't working in our district. And so we did a program evaluation, partnered with another university, uh, and they told us that we need to abandon the approach. Again, the data told the story, it wasn't working, even though teachers loved it. Um, and so we needed to pause uh, to learn about the problem. We didn't select a text. We wanted something that was right for our students and we needed to improve student outcomes. We used an external facilitator to run a literacy task force in 2019. And we focused on norming and understanding equitable pre-K-12 literacy practices that were grounded in research and the science of reading. And so after engaging in a five month comprehensive literacy or literacy course in May of 2020, the literacy task force crafted a cohe cohesive vision and framework for high quality equitable literacy instruction in all the ISD classrooms. And so in October of 2020, um, we began to monitor our work by engaging focus groups, conducting surveys and comprehensively reviewing the collected data. So we did all of this work leading into and then we ended up, um, the irony as we were going through this process, uh, remember I told you about meeting with the commissioner? He and I had, he was sending me articles. I mean, it really caught his attention. And uh, we were operating with a sense of urgency, but we were trying to make sure and sell the problem so that we could move forward. And I had that luxury because again, I was a new superintendent. Um, and so 
I literally, uh, with the commissioner, we just became obsessed thinking about how we could uh, improve literacy uh, in our in my district, but across the state. And so there was one book in particular, which really helped to form my point of view at the time. And I'm sure all of you read it, The Knowledge Gap by Natalie Wexler. The commissioner actually sent it to me. He said, hey, I'm traveling. I just read this book. Have you read it yet? And um, he's, I said, nope, but we will. And so told my CAO, we ordered the book for everyone. We began to read it. And literally there was an analogy. You probably all heard of the baseball analogy and it stood out to me. And it kind of helped me to understand um, the importance of background knowledge. And um, I'm so proud that as we were going through this process and creating our vision and framework, uh, we focused on building knowledge, foundational skills, complex texts, and writing. All those skills are important in all the ISD. So our vision and framework are grounded in research-based literacy practices, and these practices are proven through the science of teaching reading. And we went through the process, and um, I was so proud that we selected high-quality instructional materials. See, we had gone through, and I don't know how you do it in New York, but if they took you out to dinner or they sent you a coo uh, some type of, of, of cup or something, or the neighbor had that a curriculum, that's how we were making curriculum decisions. We came up with a co cohesive way that had to line up with our vision and framework in order for us to adopt the high quality materials that would be put in front of our students. And we, shifted, we shifted our approach from balanced literacy to structured literacy to build background knowledge and strengthen our foundational reading skills. Um, it was important that we implement with fidelity. And let me tell you leaders, and all of you are literacy leaders, it's about leadership. It's not just about the teachers in the classroom, it became about leadership. Literally, I was the head literacy, and oh, I consider myself the head cheerleader for the district, but from every level, we restructured our um, central office, um, my right hand, our chief academic officer, um, Dr. Davis, who's on here, he was charged with making sure that he had full support so that our teachers could be provided the resources and the support in order to move forward. So that the, 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 the challenge of implementing wasn't on the teacher. We were providing them with full support. So we have an executive director of teaching and learning, a director of literacy, literacy coaches. We repurposed positions that were uh, doing other uh, jobs that were related, but not totally uh, focused. And we had uh, to reach our goal, professional, professional learning was the key. We had monthly collective learning. Our campus and district leaders, um, even during COVID, <laughs> came together for learning sessions every month. They focused on continuous improvement in the implementation of literacy curriculum materials and the realization of our literacy vision and framework. We have quarterly literacy advisory meetings and we meet with the literacy coaches and I attend those meetings. Our chief academic officer attends those meetings so that we can understand what are the challenges and how are we moving forward. Uh, in February of 2022, and we'll host again <laughs> in 2023, we hosted our second annual Literacy Matters Conference with thousands of educators and leaders from across the country. It's now the largest free literacy conference in the United States with attendees from across the world. Our work here has also helped to inform the work across our state. Um, you know, we're really excited about uh, how we're making a difference in the conversations and how we're addressing the inequities that existed pre-pandemic, but also the learning loss that ex existed post-pandemic. Um, can we say post-pandemic yet? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so important. It's so important that our students are now being taught about subjects they find exciting and engaging. They're, be they're being drawn into lessons and stories. Um, listen, uh, when I go into classrooms in middle schools prior to uh, our new approach, our students didn't have, um, they didn't have novels. Remember I told you I went to garage sales and my grandmother bought me novels and different things, things like of that nature. We didn't have novels. They had those level books. And so an eighth grader may be reading a book on a sixth or a fifth or fourth grade level. All of our schools are on the same curriculum. And so it, it, every time I go on a campus, middle school starting this year on Bud Not Buddy. And then um, I remember our, they were reading Midsummer Night's Dream and uh, it was so powerful to see them reading Shakespeare in Aldine, a district that's predominantly black, brown, and students of poverty, and seeing our students deeply engaged in these relatable books that are on grade level. 
listen, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I think about my own beginning skills, limited skills as a teacher and all that, those skill and drill. And so certainly engaging in text, this beats those drill captions, finding the main idea and all of those different things. Our students are deeply engaged in reading. And you know, the irony is that more affluent districts have taught the gifted students and just the regular students this way for years. But we're equalizing education by offering the same thing to our students. You know, the past few years have been challenging to say the least. Um, there are quite a few things that have had our attention. COVID, <laughs> um, but I'm so proud that we didn't allow COVID to become the new excuse for uh, mediocrity or low expectations. There have been racial issues, disparities, mental health. There have been all kinds of things in Texas, and I'm sure that in New York as well, that have could have really we could have focused 100 percent of our time on. But we recognize and we hold true to the fact that we are committed to our literacy framework, and we're not going to let anything, not COVID, not anything, stand away from us moving forward. So we've navigated through the pandemic, and the curriculum has served us tremendously well during this, these tremendous times. Um, we have, you have to have the courage and that's so important. And of course you have to trust the process. And so, but when you see your, your teachers and your staff sharing these engaging le uh, lessons and uh, making sure that our students get the literacy education that they deserve. You know, I love this James Baldwin quote. It says that not everything is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. In response to meeting the needs of students in the aftermath of the pandemic, I've heard it said that we needed leadership guided by science, but in response to this literacy crisis, I would echo those same words. We need leadership guided by the science of teaching and reading. Our journey in literacy hasn't been easy. It's required hard work um, and it's required the, the support of everyone in our organization. And again, it goes back to leadership. It goes back to leadership. Uh, we've got several things. It's not a silver bullet. Uh, we didn't get into this position overnight, and so we're definitely not going to get out of it. Um, I say all the time, I don't believe in magic. I believe in people. Um, and so, but it's so important that you celebrate the small wins. Um, we uh, have results. We took uh, uh, what we call star tests in the fall, uh, and we have doubled our A and B campuses. And since 2019, the last time we had ratings, our Aldean students improved in all tests at all grade levels with the largest gains being in elementary reading. Um, we also, um, reading had the most growth and it's almost fully recovered from pre-COVID levels. Our elementary campuses outgrew the state in percent meets from spring 2021 in reading and math in all grade levels. Our eighth grade performance on star reading, math, science, social studies outgrew the state. While we have a ways to go for achievement, we're outpacing the state in growth. And that is something that we can uh, be proud of and celebrate. If we don't celebrate the wins, it won't become contagious. Our CAO told the team that and it stuck with me. So you really have to think about it. If you are going on a journey of um, being able to have those little celebrations. And in closing, our literacy journey in Aldi and ISD started because we identified the change we wanted to see. We got clear about what we wanted. We got clear about why we wanted it. And we got clear about how we needed to get there. And so as you prepare to lead, you need to remember that organizational change depends on strong leadership. And it's so important that we give the students the foundation they deserve. Uh, thank you. I hope I haven't gone over, over my time, but we can take questions at the end. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Goffney. Wow. <laughs> I've taken a couple of notes here. I wanna thank you so much for, as you said, keeping it real. Clap, clap, clap. Let This, this is all, of, we've got to keep it real right here, right now. And I'm so glad you also mentioned the book, The Knowledge Gap by Natalie Wexler. She is gonna come in to our conference to speak at the Western New York Science of Reading Conference, November 5th, y'all. And I'm gonna say y'all because I feel, I'm feeling the spirit here. Um, but Natalie Wexler is fantastic and you all need to read her book and the Aldean, the Literacy Matters uh, conference that Aldean puts on was the first literacy conference that I attended and it was amazing. Thank you so much. I will be attending again and I encourage everyone to 
to also attend. It's fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Goffney. And we will be doing a Q&A period uh, at the very end when everyone's done. So right now we're gonna switch gears and go over to Dr. Chaucer who comes from a different district and is gonna tell us her story. And she is equally as amazing. Dr. Kathleen Chaucer holds a bachelor's degree in communication disorders and sciences from the State University of New York at Geneseo and a master's degree in literacy from the University of Albany. She completed her doctorate of education at the Sage College in 2013. Kathleen has worked as a speech therapist, a first grade teacher and assistant principal and has served as the proud principal. Oops, hang on. <laughs> as the proud principal of, wait, hang on. I was reading my screen and then it just went away. Um, oh, proud principal of Milton Terrace Elementary School in Boston Spa, New York since 2009. And she wants to mention that although she believes all schools are outstanding, she is lucky to work in the best school on the planet. I love that because we all feel our schools are the best, right? Kathleen also teaches as an adjunct professor for SUNY Plattsburgh Educational Leadership Program. Kathleen shared that she was hired by Boston Spa as a first grade teacher in 2002 because of her extensive knowledge in balanced literacy and was promoted to assistant principal in 2005 for the same reason. It was not until a new superintendent, Mr. Ken Slentz, joined her district in 2018 that her understanding of the best way to teach all students to read changed. This understanding has changed the entire way that she and her teachers do their work. And she's excited to share this story with us today. Kathleen lives in downtown Saratoga Springs, New York with her 15 year old son, Sam, and her golden doodles, Olive and Theodore. Kathleen was excited to speak with us today because interestingly, she was born and raised in Western New York where she graduated from Tenbrook Academy. I hope I'm pronouncing that right in Franklinville. Welcome Dr. Chaucer. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm so honored to present alongside Dr. Goffney. I too attended the Aldine conference and um, heard uh, Dr. Whedon speak. And I also was at the defining moment with Dr. Murray and I have my um, guide right here. So it's really pretty amazing. Um, one thing I will say to the participants today, um, as you go on this journey, your edu heroes change. And the fact that I am uh, presenting alongside these edu heroes, yay, Dr. Goffney, <laughs> just uh, really, uh, you know, is, is um, surprising to me and thrilling, and I'll probably uh, pinch myself later, but in any event, thank you so much. So, um, like I said, I, I do, um, I'm so excited about this journey and, and to get to share it with you. Some of my uh, information that I'll share may be uh, similar to Dr. Goffney, so in that case, I'll just flip, flip, skip those slides. So, um, Sorry about that. Okay, so um, our just can you still hear me, Tanya? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, today I was asked to share uh, why we decided on science aligned curriculum, how we implemented it, and then advice that we would have to leaders and districts as they're going on this journey, very similar to Dr. Goffney. Um, as I said in the intro, we are so excited with the results we're seeing. We've completely changed our way of doing business, and we're really excited to talk this through. Um, so uh, as um, Dr. Whedon and Dr. Murray and Dr. Goffney talked about, really the background um, on the way that we teach students to read is really what is um, defining this, this movement. Um, interestingly, I think to folks not in education and also to maybe even secondary educators, the idea that the way that we teach students to read is controversial or is a hot topic is almost bizarre, right? If you're not in education, the idea that people can get very excited about the way that we teach kids to read is, is um, interesting and, and folks don't understand that. So I just put up a graphic here just to kind of share um, some of the differences. And, and for those of you who are balanced literacy districts, um, you know, there's a, a saying in our, our uh, group, you know, when you, once you know better, you do better. And so, you know, we're really having to repeat that to ourselves over and over again. You know, when I, I got the job as principal, you know, I've, I've got these wonderful teachers and we would sit around the child study table and just look at student data at their levels. And, and, you know, I just couldn't figure it out. I mean, we've got this positive building and these hardworking teachers and we're all working so hard, but why are we not moving that needle? So, um, like I said, once you know better, you do do better. So just to share a little bit, um, and I know this 
previous speakers have spoken about this, but reading instruction really is having a moment. You know, Karen Bates of the Curriculum Matters Group, she says, you know, curriculum is having a moment and it's really uh, reaching mainstream media. So you can see here that, you know, the New York Times had a, a um, leading article about um, Lucy Hawkins, um, even this, um, the most recent um, article or edition of Time Magazine is having, has a great article about the massive eff effort to change the way that kids are uh, taught to read. And um, recent re research on uh, reading recovery has also um, surfaced. Um, additionally, this happened in 2021, and this was really interesting to me because my brother is a principal in Fairfax County, um, but they, uh, the NAACP uh, Fairfax County sent the superintendent a letter really demanding that the children in that district uh, get access to high quality curriculum materials. So just to give you a little snapshot of uh, Milton Terry, or I'm sorry, of Boston's West Central School District. So we are uh, very... Um, uh, we're a suburban district, I would say average in size. We've got about 4,200 students. We're located um, just south of Saratoga Springs, where the racetrack is, and about 25 miles north of Albany. We have four elementary buildings and that feed to one middle and one high school. Um, you can see our breakdown of um, the rest of our student population. And um, because the state assessments have changed over the years, um, we don't have a consistent score, but when uh, Mr. Slentz came to the district, we were right about 40% proficient, I would say, on our ELA assessments. So this is our timeline of how we kind of developed um, the decision to move to the science of reading uh, as a curriculum. So when I arrived in the district in 2002, I was hired because we were a balanced, balanced literacy district I had shared. Um, and then in 2018, Mr. Slentz joined us and really um, our teachers had identified curriculum alignment as their focus area. So they were really asking for some um, consistency among um, what everyone was teaching. So uh, Mr. Slentz um, did a lot of work. He established an ELA committee that was going to learn about the science of reading and then make a selection. And um, then in 2019, 2020, that was our first year of implementation, which was going well until March when our schools all shut down, of course. So we have continued to really rely on this um, strong curriculum that we have selected. So this is just one of the um, um, guiding documents that we used for our ELA committee. We had our rationale. Our district's um, mission is that every student receives a meaningful diploma and are able to read and write on or above grade level. Here were the goals that we set for our uh, curriculum adoption um, committee and then an overview of the process. So um, similar to Aldine, we did a lot of work with building a common foundation of knowledge and understanding of the science of the way that kids learn to read. So this was a blueprint that Mr. Slentz put together that we used as our guiding document on um, understanding uh, how kids learn to read and also what we all agree on. So similarly to Aldine, we've got, you know, we start with the science, we determine where our readers are, build a strong foundation, and then on and on. And it really, it cites that, um, research here as well. So our ELA committee read all of this research and then of course went on to make a selection based on this common understanding. So our committee um, used ed reports and Louisiana Believes, which are non-biased vetting sites and um, obviously aligned to the New York State standards and um, aligned to the blueprint that we all agreed on to make our decisions. Um, we looked at four um, curriculum materials. So we looked at EL education, wit and wisdom, core knowledge, and bookworms. Um, we had all of the different representatives of the group um, review all of the curriculum resources that we had um, talked about. And we um, were hoping, interestingly, a few of us were hoping that the teachers would pick wit and wisdom because it was aligned to foundations which we were already using in a few schools. Um, but interestingly, our teachers selected bookworms. So they made a um, pitch to the superintendent. They gave him their reasons at the ELA committee and he we went with bookworms. And so um, we're really excited about that decision and we've seen some really great results. So bookworms is um, uh, authored by Dr. Sharon Walpole out of the University of Delaware. She's a researcher who um, was a balanced literacy um, guru like so many of us and really felt obligated to write this curriculum because of what she learned in her research. So there is a free version of Bookworms online and through open source. Um, there are three 45-minute blocks 
and um, it's really um, rich with authentic texts. It's knowledge building, and as I said, research researcher developed. Um, in the knowledge gap, at the end of the knowledge gap, Natalie Wexler talks about knowledge building curriculums and ones that we should really be on the lookout for. And she does identify bookworms as one of her recommended um, curriculum materials. So this is just a whole view of what we um, use to teach in. Balsam Spa. So we use Bookworms K5, and then we use um, Foundations and Haggerty, which are phonemic awareness and fun, um, phonological awareness um, programs for K1. And then we use geodes to supplement. Those are decodable readers. We assess three times a year and um, use iReady and Dibbles as our assess main assessment tools. So this is our district's um, kind of guiding document in terms of the role that everybody plays in making sure that every student reads at or above grade level through explicit instruction. And this is um, all of the ways that we do that. So it really um, started with explicitly trained principals. So um, Mr. Slens felt that it was important that we carry the water. And so he had us trained first. So as soon as we selected bookworms, um, the leadership team flew out to Atlanta and we were trained directly from Dr. Walpole and her team. And that was really helpful because then I was able to come back to my building and share my excitement and my enthusiasm. When we were there, we got to hear Tim Shanahan speak, Dr. Walpole, and it was really just a really significant um, learning experience for us and also helped to kind of get that ball rolling with that excitement that Dr. Goffney talked about. So as I said, the principals were trained first. Um, we um, Bookworms was the least expensive of the four choices, but we did purchase everything that went with it. Like Dr. Goffney said, she, she um, hired someone to make sure that there were no barriers for teachers. And that's really what we felt as well. Like we didn't want teachers to be able to say, gosh, we didn't have this, or it'd be helpful if you had purchased this part of the program. So we bought everything. Um, we paid every teacher to come in over the summer and we did some summer unpacking PD days where we showed them what all the stuff was, talked them through through that curriculum and um, you know, had some modeling done. The district committed to implementing new literacy coaches. So those coaches come into the classrooms and model and support teachers. And um, similar to Aldine, we had weekly PD built into the teacher schedules so that there was um, consistent PD that every teacher got during that first year of implementation. Here are some of our highlights and challenges you can see. Um, one thing that I did not understand as a principal and as what I thought was a, a um, somewhat expert in, in literacy instruction, um, I did not understand the profound impact that a solid tier one curriculum has. You know, it was like we were trying to intervene our way out of the problem with our interventionists at tier three, but we didn't understand it was what's meant to be in what it's what happens in the classroom every day and knowing that it's solid and it's rich and it's explicit and systematic and that we know what everyone got therefore when uh, problems are identified we can then go back to that tier one and say we know this is the, what everybody was taught and now we can you know intervene accordingly um, we received a lot of support directly from Sharon Walpole and her team, and I suspect as Bookworms gets more traction, that will be less available, but Dr. Walpole and her team flew out here and were in our schools, in my classrooms, modeling for our teachers, and that was really, really um, exciting and helpful. Um, and we also have some encouraging data. Some of our challenges, obviously the pandemic and remote learning as everyone has shared. Um, some teachers, as Dr. Goffney said, have been resistant to this. You know, this is a, um, or for a lot of uh, educators, we're finding that this was really a lot about their, um, who they are about their identity as an educator. You know, I'm a teacher, I'm a reading recovery teacher, you know, I know about balanced literacy. And so we've had to, you know, obviously support teachers through that. And um, there are some teachers who are still, you know, um, resistant to the change, but we're seeing, you know, um, for the large part, everyone is kind of on board and working to um, implement our new curriculum. And then lastly, a challenge about fitting it all in, as I'm sure everyone has heard, just finding the time and the schedule to teach all of the parts and making sure that we get to everything. So what does our instruction look like? I have, um, I think we're running short on time, but I will share this with Taria. I have um, just some links to some of my Twitter posts where it shows what, um, what it looks like um, in the day in our classrooms. So I'll share that with you, Taria. Um, here's a snapshot of some of our results. So at this point, we can only um, 
uh, measure ourselves against ourselves because as I shared, the New York state assessments were canceled the year. We were really looking forward to those state assessments the year COVID happened. So um, you can see here, these were last year's results um, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So here I've got kindergarten and third grade. So you can see, you know, at kindergarten, we started at 19% proficient on iReady and ended the year at 86%. Um, and in third grade, we started the year in iReady at 53% and ended at 80%. So we're still, um, you know, as with any new curriculum implementation, we understand that in a few years, once we have kids who started with us in kindergarten and got the full program all the way through, we really hope to see that traction pick up. Um, but we are um, celebrating the small wins as Dr. Goffney shared. Again, these are some links to just how, how what our teachers are saying about it. Every year, Milton Terrace, my school, does a summer book study for the staff. And so we did the knowledge gap a few years ago. This year, we're doing um, Follow the Science to um, School. It's a book all about summarizing um, the elementary research and um, what it tells about elementary or best practices for elementary teachers. Because oftentimes, when you um, see information on best practices, it's for secondary folks. So, anyways, this was a, um, I just videoed some of our book study meetings over the summer with teachers talking about what they've learned through this implementation. So here I have listed some recommendations for leaders looking to implement. Um, I, I put the links here. There are a lot of great um, resources out there. And then um, as you make the implementation, or I'm sorry, the curriculum selection, here are some recommendations. Um, I would say, um, obviously, um, you know, using those non-biased vetting resources like Ed Reports and Louisiana Police were really helpful. Also limiting the selection choices um, and be aware of the vendor pitches, just like Dr. Goffney said, you know, and, and I'm embarrassed, Dr. Goffney, but I used to also probably pick the ones that took us out for dinner and it wasn't because they did, but you just think you're doing the best, right? Like they've got the best swag and you're like, oh yeah, that, they, that, that sounds good. Yeah, let's sign up for that. And especially when you're implementing HQIM, you've got to be very careful of the cell because, um, for example, we feel that Bookworms is a really strong, rigorous, high quality instructional material, but the guy who does the pitch for Bookworms, I'm pretty sure is also the tech guy because they just don't have, there's not a lot of you know, money in publishing behind it, but it's still very high quality. So I think that part where you make sure that you educate your um, curriculum selection committee so that they are very um, careful selectors, <laughs> if you will, and, you know, really um, savvy consumers. So just making sure that they know what they're looking at and knowing what the product is. Um, and then obviously linking those district um, structures back, you know, with the district goals back to the implementation is great. Here are some things that I learned just as a leader um, throughout the process. Um, literacy instruction really is a social justice issue. I did not understand that until we were um, on our way, but access to these high quality curriculum materials is something that every child deserves. Um, Kareem Weaver, um, who is also speaking at the um, Western New York um, uh, conference in November, he, um, on one of the podcasts I listened to, he said, um, leaders, you need your team to follow you through this. The ability to convince people to move when they don't have to, to get them to suspend their beliefs and to try something new for the furtherance of a goal. The cell, that's your job. And I really feel like it is on us as building leaders and district leaders to make sure that people understand this information and to get our teams on board with this. Um, I didn't understand why culture mattered until we did this. I have a very positive school environment and I was very fortunate that when we had to, I had to get them to do this, right? I had to get them to suspend their belief and, and leave what they knew. Um, the fact that they came with me, that was very helpful. And I think having that positive culture was very helpful. Um, this is teaching rocket, I'm sorry, teaching reading is rocket science and most universities are not arming their teachers with this information. Um, at least here, our local universities are still for the most part balanced literacy and teaching their students that information so they're not coming to the to us with this and I know there's a whole other conversation to be had about you know sec, um, the role of secondary education in this, this work but um, until that happens, it's our job as leaders to make sure that teachers have this information. Um, I teach an adjunct class at a local university on assessment, and I do this whole like boot camp little thing before we get started, just to you know give them this information that's out there because I just feel obligated to share this, and it's just shocking that no one knows it, right? Even still, no one knows this information. So I really do think it is our job to be teaching that. 
Um, one of the things that we learned when we were in Atlanta being trained, one of the um, teachers from Atlanta said, give your teachers grace. This is hard. They, you know, as our superintendent used to say, our teachers used to be experts and now they're novices and we have to respect that and support them through that experience. You know, teachers who've been teaching for 20, 30 years are basically being told you have this whole new thing we want you to do. Be respectful of that and be supportive and, and you know, support them through that. And then my last thing is that I just cannot unsee it. I feel like I can't even appreciate a good meme or a good joke because I'm like, actually, that's not correct. You know, learning styles are, are actually defunct, you know. So I just, I think that, you know, as you go through this process, you'll realize how much misinformation is out there and really what our job is to make sure that the correct information is out there. And just for a closing thought, as Dr. Gaffney shared, it really is our job to make sure that um, the adults around us are aware of the benefits of structured literacy, because ultimately it is our greatest defense against illiteracy. And that's it. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaucer. You know, several things that you said really struck me. Um, and I'll start with culture really does matter. You know, and I want to applaud all of you for, you know, educators across Western New York, leaders across Western New York, you are here learning new things and investing in that culture. And so I applaud you. And and also, Dr. Chaucer, you were talking about uh, the role of higher education to teacher training programs, things like that. And absolutely, Everyone is a partner in this literacy journey and they are a key, they play a key role um, and we need them on board. Um, one of our new partners in the Western New York Literacy Initiative is Villa Maria College, which hats off to them. You know, the president understood immediately the implications of what we were saying and the science of reading and everything going on. And, you know, we need other institutions of higher education to also get on board. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Goffney and Dr. Chaucer. Um, we are going to do a, uh, a Q&A. So everyone, the chat is available to you. If you want to submit a question, it will go straight to our speakers. Um, and uh, we will try to take a couple of questions. And in the meantime, I did receive a couple of questions beforehand that I will start us off with until we get some questions in the chat. And this is interesting. Someone wrote in, it's been reported that even with new materials, six and 10 teachers continue to use their old materials or debunked methods. And how do we prevent this from happening? So uh, Dr. Goffney, if you wanna start us off and then we'll go over to Dr. Chaucer. Yes, and I'm gonna, uh, the person's absolutely right. So our chief academic officer, he's gonna explain our learning walks and how we uh, mo monitor implementation. Well, thank you, Dr. Alfred. That, was a, that is a fantastic question. I think the, the first thing that I would lean on is making sure that there is a coherent expectation that's de developed throughout the district. Uh, I want to emphasize for us, it was the development of a literacy framework, vision and framework that became the anchor that was then ultimately the decision, the, the coherent tool that made the decision to go with a, a, a high quality instructional materials, a new curriculum, uh, a reality. And then from that point, you you need to have a, a literacy leader like a superintendent like Dr. Goffney that is your champion in, in the district that makes literacy and the curriculum our new approach as a priority in all things that we do and leads every conversation with that uh, message being sent. From there, there, you know, the curriculum that you develop is a piece of the strategy. There are multiple uh, enabling conditions that need to be built out in order to make the curriculum an actual success and that it is becoming uh, integrated within your system and accepted by all of your teachers. One of those is making sure that you've got a strong professional learning strategy, that you've got a strong strategy around collaborative uh, planning, uh, developing new tools for and protocols for planning, but then also having a monitoring system so that we can monitor the level of investment in, that our teachers have their needs if we see that there's a, a variance in investment to where we've set our goals and then uh, of course monitoring on a frequent basis the implementation we set goals in our first year of 80 percent investment and 80 percent implementation and we did learning walks that were just targeted on those two 
uh, key metrics. And then we ramped that up to 90% our second year. And we're really pleased to see that we saw both marks were hit in both years. We met our goals. And I really want to ground that in the fact that we, we held tight to our expectations, but then we knew that there was great responsibility to provide support for our teachers ongoing and and our leaders, of course, uh, Dr. Chaucer, you are absolutely right. This starts with building leadership capacity. And uh, so with that, we continue to get feedback from our teachers, get feedback from our learners, because it, our implementation of the curriculum is ever evolving. And at this point, we need to make sure that we are continuing to serve the needs. But one thing that we don't waver on is our approach. You know, we have a coherent expectation for literacy instruction but we will continue to get feedback and we'll continue to increase our level of support and do enhancements to, our, to the curriculum where we find it necessary based on feedback from leaders and teachers. Always staying though, anchored in our vision and framework. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Dr. Chaucer, do you want to um, answer about how you um, fight the fact that some teachers continue to use um, sort of the debunked methods? Sure, so I would I agree with everything um, Dr. Davis said. I would also add that we have um, uh, intervention cycles built in. We have an intervention calendar, so we're meeting at the end of every six-week cycle to review data and to um, make tweaks. So the director of curriculum content meets with each building principal and our interventionist team. We review the data, and then we build in time in that schedule for them to then go back and, and speak with classroom teachers. So the data really is also telling the story. So I, you know, and I mean, you know, it's part of um, you know, it's a part of leadership that no one loves, but it's our job, right? So to have those hard conversations about, you know, this is not looking great and what can we do to fix it? And then to have those, um, as Dr. Davis said, to have those supports right there to, to help the, the teachers. So for example, we've got the literacy coaches, we've got, you know, they can come in and model and can, or can, you know, um, teach their class while they go and watch another teacher or something like that. And then also um, uh, just providing that PD, PD opportunity, opportunities um, frequently um, as well. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, that is part of the hard work of leadership for sure. Okay, we've got another question um, that's come in and it says, what does specially designed reading instruction look like for students with dyslexia? Um, Dr. Goffney, I'll, I'll put that to you first. Yeah, Dr. Davis. So the curriculum that we adopted was the, the core knowledge, the Amplify, and the Amplify product. Uh, the, uh, the foundation support for foundational um, the learning uh, the strategy is, is, is built in within that curriculum. Um, I'm not sure necessarily how to approach the, the question other than that we are very thankful that that is integrated within the curriculum structures and it is part of our strategy, our vision and framework. And it is, uh, uh, again, a coherent expectation across the district. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Chaucer. So um, in every classroom, and I'm sure Dr. Mur uh, Murray or Dr. Whedon could correct me, but I'm pretty sure that in every classroom, there's about 30% of children who need explicit phonics instruction, but we don't know who that 30% are. So that's the thing. And you know, I, I'm sure you've seen the graphic that shows, you know, um, phonics, you know, explicit phonics instruction and, and foundational skill work at an early age doesn't hurt anybody. But, you know, for those kids who need it, and we don't know who those kids are, everybody benefits from it, um, even for your higher students. And, and we were actually noticing that at our end of the year data, even our high kids who came in really high in first grade, getting that explicit instruction did not hurt them. Because just because they can read does not mean that they also can spell and know, you know, um, tricky vowel patterns and sophisticated things like that. So in any event, uh, but back to that. So, so um, the thing is that um, you want to get a, a, a curriculum in HQIM that has solid foundational skills built into it, and then you're monitoring the progress all of the time so that you can then intervene. So I had showed this slide, and I'm sorry, I have it right here. It's um, <laughs> the um, Dr. Walpole. We use her. Um, from Walpole and McKenna, their um, differentiated instruction. So it's her differentiation differentiated kit. It's the staircase of, of literacy learning. And so we're able to really identify the constrained skill and intervene based on that constrained skill and then you know monitor progress accordingly. Okay, great. 
Thank you. Um, all right, let's take another question that has come in. And for those um, of you, if you still want to submit a question in the chat, feel free to do so. Um, okay, can we just supplement the components missing from the balanced literacy program? Um, Dr. Goffney? In our district, no, it's a hard no for us. Um, our district, again, was the, the castle for balanced literacy. And that was one of the things wanting to take this part and take this apart. Um, I think uh, to what our co my colleague, Dr. Chaucer alluded to, explicit instruction for all is the way to go. Uh, we've heard from our uh, director of dyslexia. She was so excited when we changed our approach. Um, we are um, trending with fewer students qualifying for dyslexia because we're providing that um, strong foundation in the classroom. And so um, I'm a, in my district and my leadership, it's a hard no for us. And so we are um, staying true to um, the science of teaching reading and, um, and we, we're seeing the gains. And so, and it also, I think it's a mindset. And this is Latonyaism. So um, for those who believe strongly, I think it's a mindset and belief on what kids can and cannot do. And um, I, so it's, uh, Dr. Davis, you'll clean it up for me, but yeah, it's, it's a hard no for me. It's a hard no, but <laughs> I think the, the I, I like to say that the cornerstone of our literacy framework is, is the building knowledge component of the curriculum. And I cannot imagine supplementing the units of study to the extent that you could truly say that you have a knowledge building curriculum. The, the lift is too significant, the way to articulate that um, so that you see connections from uh, grade level over grade level. So students are progressing through a system where the knowledge is building upon each other. I can't imagine that to be done with fidelity. Um, and then in addition, as we've said, the, ex the explicit instruction for every student is a necessity. We try to supplement Lucy Calkins with a foundational, the foundation curriculum. It did not work. And it still left too much autonomy to our teachers and how they determined what good foundational learning looked like and instruction looked like. We needed to have a systemic uh, approach to that that left no opportunity for teachers to dilute or lower expectations for our students and the quality of, of learning for our students. So uh, as Dr. Goffney said, no, it's a hard no. And I just want to throw in while well, I have an opportunity for those of you who may be concerned about the teachers that might divert from this or might have difficulty gravitating to it. Just stick to the process and once they start seeing the transformation of the conversations, the discourse, the level of vocabulary that your students are using in the classroom there it's it's hard for them to go back to previous practice the the winds become contagious and. Uh, if you can just stick to the plan and look towards playing a long game, not quick fixes, then your teachers will see the wins and will gravitate to the to the curriculum and the science of reading. Yes, thank you. I have a feeling Dr. Chaucer is going to agree with you on that. Dr. Chaucer? Just quickly, one more thing about the question on dyslexia. Um, Emily Hanford is a reporter, and I'm sure most of you know who she is. She is, you know, world renowned for her work, um, and her work really coincided with both um, Aldine and Belston Spazic limitations in a perfect time. Because if you haven't heard those um, podcasts, they're they're brilliant. But in any event, she actually. Well, she and Natalie Wexler, they're just, I don't mean just journalists, but they're not educators. And so they went out, Emily Hanford went out looking to find why um, dyslexic students were not being taught to read in our elementary schools. And then she found out that all kids were not being, were not learning to read as they should. So I think that um, good instruction for dys, for all students are is good instruction for dyslexic students. And then you're able, if you're, you know, assessing regularly and able to really pinpoint areas of need. I just wanted to have said that. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, my superintendent, uh, former superintendent would always say, you know, 
it's not that balanced literacy is horrible or bad. It's just that we have a finite amount of time with our students every day and every year. And how do you want to spend that time? You know, teachers are my teachers during their planning time, at least I can speak to mine. They used to spend it hunting and gathering, searching teachers, paid teachers, trying to put things together and make up lessons. And that's not really fair. You know, my superintendent would say, okay, how many people in the audience have a degree in curriculum writing? Right, none of us, because that's not our job. So to ask you to create and deliver high quality instruction is not fair. As leaders, it's our job to provide teachers with high quality curriculum, and then their planning time is spent preparing to deliver it. And that's really a change that really um, kind of shifts and, and helps. And teachers feel glad to have it given to them. You know, they, you know, I have a, a kindergarten teacher who's been teaching 33 years, and she says, I never have, I mean, and she's just magical, right? She was magical before, she's magical now, but she just says, I have never in my all, you know, all of my years seen the growth I have, and it's just because I didn't know. Um, so how do you want your teachers to spend their time? And it's also as much about what you are not doing as what you are doing. So, because that's all of our first reaction with a big change, right? Oh, I can just keep, oh yeah, that's basically what I'm doing. I'll just add this little thing. Actually on, um, on Twitter, they call it the hashtag phonics patch to try and smack a Band-Aid on your existing program. And, and really, it just doesn't work because it's, it's about what you're not doing as well. And balanced literacy just is not that systematic, explicit, deliberate, consistent tier one that we need. Mm -hmm. Yes, well said. Um, okay, let's take one final question and then we will wrap it up so that we can be respectful of everyone's time. Um, okay, let's see. I, and you know what, I think you guys answered this, but I'll, I'll ask the question anyway. Do you use instructional support or outside coaches to support your teachers? And I, as I recall, I remember both of you saying that you do have coaching. Can you talk to that and how important it is uh, in support of your teachers? We'll start with Dr. Goffney. Uh, yes, we, um, and Dr. Davis, if you would um, make sure that it's cohesive, but basically we had internal coaches um, already in the district. So we were able to um, repurpose them and um, focus on how they were gonna support our literacy launch. In addition, um, we also use some uh, external support. And so um, Dr. Davis, will you connect all the dots for all the support that we provide? Uh, it was similar to Dr. Chaucer, which is when I was texting you in the background, like it's amazing how, um, there's a way to provide support for teachers so they, they don't use the excuse that and, and go back to the, the old way of doing things. Mm. Yeah, we, we needed to we tar target our literacy coaches. We had literacy coaches already that were, were deeply rooted in balanced literacy. So we needed to, they were our, really our first layer of exposure to the, to the, uh, the vision and framework. Uh, they were integral part in the development, but we also found that they were going to be our biggest um, uh challenge to have get bought in and uh so we needed to make sure that we number one we focused on building their capacity but then we also needed to say if this is not a match for you then there are districts that are still doing this old practice and you may need to go there because we are like we said there's this is a hard no and so we we had about a 50 percent turnover in our coaches and it needed to happen because we could not have literacy leaders that were still going to be a barrier for us in the district. So that was one of our first layers. But then at that point, we, we developed a, a ongoing learning structure for them and then set up the understanding that the their direct impact is in the classroom every single day. And then we tried to create the channels uh, so that the, that impact could be felt on a daily basis. We not only had them created district level coaches, but we had to create a, a campus level leader as well. And so that we had this waterfall effect where we supported our district coaches who then supported the, the campus instructional coach who then had that opportunity to get into a classroom every single day. And while we're doing all of this, we're giving our assistant principals and our principals that same level of training and support so that there was at no point in our system was there a layer that we could feel like you, you're not informed or that you have, um, or because you're misinformed, you might be a barrier to the implementation of the curriculum. Okay, thank you. Dr. Chaucer, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, we too have um, instructional coaches and they have been very, very helpful, but I would just add 
equally as important as the coaches is the building principles relationship with your teachers, because um, once it gets moving and, and your teachers are jumping on board, I have found that my reading teachers have become unofficial coaches. So they are just, you know, our um, some of our colleagues say that we're like, you know, born again reading teachers because we're just so excited to share this good word. Um, we're just thrilled that, you know, we, my, my teachers joke, they're like, you know, Dr. Walpole should give us a kickback because we can sell that stuff, you know, because there are, you know, people will just see us on Twitter and reach out and say, hey, like we, you know, talk with people around the country. And, but I always bring my reading teachers because they are the ones doing the work and who are just thrilled with the results and who are also um, supporting teachers in the classroom. Mm. Good point. Yes, it, it really is about um, teachers having the training and the support and also leadership knowing as well. Um, and I also want to read a comment if you haven't seen it in the chat from Maria Murray at the Reading League. Um, Consult the Reading League's curriculum evaluation guidelines to avoid those who have red flags of not being in alignment with the findings from science of reading. So that's a great point. Um, and I would encourage all of you, um, I mean, that will wrap up our question and answer period, but I would encourage all of you to feel free to reach out to Dr. Murray at the Reading League. They're an amazing resource. Dr. Whedon at uh, Nighthouse Education Center, an amazing resource. Dr. Goffney, Dr. Chaucer. That's one of the things that I found as I've begun my journey is that People are passionate about wanting to help others learn as well. We, we are all here for each other. And that is what I wanna emphasize with the Western New York Literacy Initiative is that uh, Western New York, New York, we are here for you. Um, we're here to support you in this journey. Thank you so much for taking this step today and learning and having that courage to uh, be strong in your leadership. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, please reach out with any questions at any time. Thank you to our speakers, bye.